Well, good morning. My name is Tony Van Duzer, and I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa in the Faculty of Law, and it's my very great pleasure to be chairing this panel, third panel, which deals with the reactions to investor state arbitration in Asia. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have uh, three excellent uh, panelists who have uh, experience uh, in this area who are going to speak about the uh, experience in their respective countries. And while I uh, am sensitive to the timing uh, pressures which we have been under and, and uh, also conscious of the remarkable success with which the organizers have kept us on the schedule, um, I still feel emboldened to uh, say a very brief introduction for, for, for each of the panelists. I first would just like to, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. Now, I note, uh, as uh, Amon mentioned at the beginning, that there are detailed bios of each of the panelists in the materials, but I just maybe would give you the bit at the top line uh, of their introduction. Uh, so again, in the order they're going to speak, uh, in, my, on, in the middle of the group here is uh, Shitaro Hamado, who is a professor at Kyoto uh, University's Graduate School of Law. Uh, on his right, at the extreme end, uh, sorry, left, at the extreme end of the table, your right, my left, uh, is uh, Yun Sit Kim, who's an assistant professor of constitutional law at the Sungshin uh, Women's University in Korea. And then immediately on, on my left, is Leon Trackman, who's the immediate past dean at the um, University of New South Wales in, in Australia. He's also, of course, a professor there and well known to all of us in Canada as a longtime professor at Dalhousie University Law School. So with that very brief uh, introduction, I'll, I'll ask Shatoro to, uh, to get started. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful event. My name is Shita Hamamoto, Professor of National Kyoto University, and I'm supposed to talk about the Japanese policies on the investment arbitration, particularly in the context of the investment arbitration with, between developed democracies. Well, I'm not going to, I don't think I need the 15 minutes to go because uh, I don't, I'm not going to talk about the Japanese policy on international investment agreements or international investment law in general. If you're by any chance interested in Japanese policy in that field, I would like, I'd be grateful uh, if you could look at my previous papers quoted in my paper. Um, so uh, the subject uh, of this session is about the investor state arbitration between democ uh, developed dem democracies. And in Japan, um, there has been no discussion at all uh, until 2011 about legitimacy or appropriateness of investor state arbitration in the diet, Japanese parliament, or in in, in the media, or of course in the, in the academics, there has been some people, so several number of people, uh, including myself, who have been writing uh, papers on international investment law, but of course academic papers do not really attract public attention. And, and the first BIT that Japan was concluded was with Egypt in 1978, but nobody was interested in it. And uh, Japanese gov Jap Japan is one of the first states which concluded investment treaties with other developed democracies, for example, the, Rep the Republic of Korea in 2002 or Switzerland in 2009. But these treaties did not really interest, it, again, uh, the public. And suddenly, in 2011, uh, people got interested in the investment agreement or investor state arbitration when the government declared that it would officially think about joining negotiations in the TPP. Well, the government didn't say that they will join the negotiation. They said they will think about joining the negotiation in the TPP, but that aroused an enormous public uh, debate. Mm -hmm. And the public, particularly the opponents to the TPP, suddenly discovered investor state arbitration in that year. And I see here a huge influence of the Korean debate, actually. And Korea concluded, as my colleague is going to explain, uh, they concluded the FTA with, with the United States, chorus, and there has been much debate in Korea about the appropriateness or legitimacy of the investor state arbitration, and there has been some sort of cooperation, invisible cooperation or explicit cooperation between Japanese and Korean civil societies. And, and so the, the arguments, uh, particularly critical arguments against investor state arbitration in Japan looks quite similar to the arguments developing in Korea. Um, 
And we see here a very familiar criticisms addressed to the investor set arbitration. For example, the investor set arbitration, ISA, infringes uh, sovereignty and encroaches sovereignty or it erodes sovereignty. Or the ISA infringes the constitution, particularly independence of the judiciary or legislative power. Or investor set arbitration unduly restricts regulatory space. They may be right, they may be wrong, they probably uh, the truth, uh, truth is in the middle. But anyway, uh, we don't see any particular specific Japanese argument. Uh, the, I mean, critical arguments developing in Japan that are quite similar to uh, those we hear uh, in other parts of the world. And what's interesting in the Japanese debate is not the substance. But I would say it, it, it's object. It's, of course, TPP, Trans -partner Partnership, uh, Pacific Partnership. And uh, the critical arguments on EISA uh, are always, without exception, uh, raised in the context of TPP. For example, Japan is negotiating an economic partnership agreement, free trade agreement, with the, the European Union or with Canada. But nobody criticizes investor set arbitration in the context of Japan EU, EFT, EPA, or Japan Canada uh, EPA. I'm not uh, what the government says, and that the investor set arbitration will be going to is going to be included in the Japan EU FTA or Japan Canada FTA. But people are not really interested in it. And another thing is another interesting thing is that. If you look at the parliamentary debates in the diet, Japanese diet, you see that critical arguments on the investor state, state arbitration are always, always raised by the opposition parties, by opposition parties. And we experienced government change recently twice, first in 2009 and then 2012. And the government in power are always promoting free trade, free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties. And uh, parliamentarians belonging to the, the parties and the government always support the government policy, so they are silent about investor set arbitration. <coughs> and when they go in the position, they suddenly become vocal and uh, speak against investor set arbitration. For example, the people who are criticizing investor set arbitration in 2011, now uh, they are completely silent in the parliament. And the people which are supporting the government's policy on the FTA or BIT in 2011 are now criticizing the, the, government's, the incumbent government's policy on FTA or the BIT concerning investor state arbitration. This is another interesting, interesting um, aspect in the Japanese argument. And probably more interestingly, um, we hear since 2011 uh, lots of arguments against the investor set arbitration, even in the Diet, in, in the Parliament. And as I said, it's always in the context of the TPP. And the parliamentarians always vote by unanimity in favor of investment treaties concluded with other countries. Since 2011, Japan has concluded, I don't know how many investment treaties, or six, seven, even more. And almost all of those, those treaties are uh, approved by the parliament by unanimity or by an overwhelming majority with probably five or six votes against. So people who are criticizing investor set arbitration are voting in favor of bad investment treaties or FTAs concluded with Mongolia, Papua New Guinea, or um, other Asian and the Pacific states. Is there any particular argument relating to the BIT FTA with developed democracies of developed states in Japan? Well, it, it is often said that we don't need BIT or investor said arbitration with dem dem developed democracies, I'm sorry. Um, I know some academics writing that to, uh, to that effect, um, but uh, quite unfortunately, there has been no profound discussion on this subject, and I think there is a, a profound problem in this argument. I'm quite frankly speaking, it, is, it seems to me that it is quite untenable to say that we don't need investor state arbitration with the developed democracies 
Because, well, there are several reasons. First, um, we have the other court systems in international law, for example, International Court of Justice, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And we see uh, quite a number of cases, recent, particularly recently, before these tri courts and tribunals in which developed democracies become defendants. Well, look at, for example, the recent Germany-Italy uh, sovereign immunity cases. The, the International Court of Justice conclu concluded that the judgment of the Supreme Court of Italy violated international law. And we know that uh, the United States experienced several difficult consular rights cases, Avena Breach um, and uh, Lagron, in which the United States had really a difficult position before the International Court of Justice. And Belgium, of course, uh, found, viola found violating inter international law in the RS warrant cases. So there are lots of um, democrat uh, the developed the democracies are found violating international law by these courts, I mean, but not only by the International Court of Justice, but of course it's possible that the developed democracies are brought before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, for example, in the prompt of release cases. And secondly, secondly, and probably more practically speaking, <coughs> it'll be, I suppose that it'll be very difficult for treaty negotiators uh, to say that, you know, we need uh, investor state arbitration only with the de de developed democracies. For example, <clears throat> Japan concludes a number of economic partnership agreements, which is a Japanese appellation of free trade agreements. You know, it's an economic partnership agreement. Um, <clears throat> we are now going to conclude this agreement because we, are, we want to be an uh, economic partner with you. And we need to include the investor state ar arbitration because we don't trust you. Can you really say that? Um, I doubt. So the, uh, the idea that we don't need the investor state arbitration with the developed democracies will put the treaty negotiators in a quite a difficult position. So um, all in all, uh, the Japanese argument, Japanese this debates concerning the investor state arbitration is not quite unfortunately and not quite developed. We, uh, we find arguments mainly or almost exclusively against Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP agreements, and nobody is, frankly speaking, nobody is interested in New Zealand, Australia, but everybody is thinking about, of course, the United States. Now, the critics say that the United States is now invading Japan with the ISA and investor state arbitration. The investor state arbitration were created only for the U.S. companies, and Therefore, the U.S. companies are using this, uh, this tool to invade other states' sovereignty. This kind of argument uh, we hear quite often in the Japanese debate. But uh, in, con in the context of other um, treaties, for example, the European Union and Canada, we don't hear much th that kind of argument. Thank you very much. That's it. Uh, Sik, would you like to go next? Okay, uh, so can you show uh, the, my the PPT slide? Okay, yeah, so uh, today is because of the time limits, uh, instead of instruction, I will give you a kind of the video clip, though like this. Oh. <laughs>
Since actually, the uh, in 19, uh, 2011, 12, uh, actually, the um, this scene was recorded in the plenary session of the Korean National Assembly, the where the bill of uh, Korea U.S. free trade agreement was discussed. A uh, lawmaker of the left wing uh, party spread a tear gas uh, as a symbolic action against the, the governing party to railroad the uh, bill of the Korea US FTA, uh, the bill of the Korea US FTA. The people called this trade pack as a uh, Coros FTA, the, as an acronym of a Korea US free trade agreement, but uh, a Korean English newspaper ridiculed that the Coros FTA was not made in Coros like this. Anyway, and that time, the many critical commentators focused on so-called sovereignty concerns, which were mostly uh, related to uh, investor state arbitration coupled with uh, indirect expropriation clauses. The, as you know, in the many the notorious NAFTA cases, the uh, people in Korea thought uh, these, uh, those problems of NAFTA will be repeated in Korea in the near future. Uh, this was considered as a kind of the political risk because the people might be very angry about their uh, people if it would allow the foreign investor to disturb the uh, public welfare or environment protection policies. Of course, uh, you know, um, the Korean government officially support the principal policies to support the ISA, ISA in this state arbitration according to this calculation of cost and benefit factors, as you can see in this slide. The government is saying that ISA will be uh, very helpful in attracting the foreign direct investment, FDI, and also in protecting Korean investment uh, placed abroad, especially against developing countries uh, such as uh, uh, China and other uh, e Asian countries. But also, it seems to think, the Korean seems to think that uh, political risk factors will be overwhelmed by the benefits of uh, ISA. But uh, I would think, uh, I would like to argue that uh, such a uh, cost-benefit calculation the, about the ISDS, the ISA, might not be simple like that. Korean policymakers seem to realize that they uh, underestimate the future political the risk that I mentioned in the previous slide. And on the other hand, Korean uh, critical scholars the, criticize the government officials overestimated you know, um, the benefits of ISA. The, of course, I argue uh, additional benefits which are part, uh, peculiar only to Korea uh, uh, as we will discuss in the later part of these presentations. And the, you know, um, the most important things all people accept in Korea is that the uh, reverse point of this analysis there has been moved, uh, the, the uh, liberal point of this scale has been moved because the Korean economic development has changed the Korean position from the investment importing countries to investment exporting countries. So in this context, I would like to uh, I would like to explain the historical development of the Korean uh, international investment uh, policies. So, okay. The first of all, Korea has persistently has included ISA provisions in the most BITs uh, as it pursued BITs with the most uh, developed countries since 1960s. 
In addition, Korea was actively involved in the exit systems by signing the uh, exit convention in 1967. At that time, Korea was extremely desperate to attract more foreign uh, investments, as you can see in the left side of the picture of this slide. Korea was totally destroyed after the uh, Korean War the, between the South and North Korea, uh, as you know. The unfortunate, unfortunately, Korea did not have enough natural resources to promote national economy. Under those, uh, those uh, conditions, the Korean policymaker decided to open the national economy to the global investor in order to attract the foreign investment. In this context, uh, the bits with the developed countries were one of the main projects to boost the Korean economy. So one of one of features of the first generation of a Korean BIT is that uh, liberal list languages in favor of foreign investors. As you know, the in the, uh, the early period of BITs, the Korean BITs the were the just one or two pages with very abstract, uh, simple terms. So. Uh, so if we analyze at the current perspective, this style of treaty uh, drafting, uh, this, this, uh, this style of treaty drafting allows the uh, treaty jurisdictions to cover more of various government actions and increase the risk to be involved in the investment claims. But at that time, at that time, so, um, the calculation was so simple and naive like that uh, Korea was extremely desperate to attract the FTA, and also the government was not fully aware. Government was not fully aware of the risk of the investment claims because the uh, exit system was very uh, suspicious at that time. We don't know about where exit system will be successful in the future the, at that time. So. Anyway, so also the civil society uh, did not uh, recognize the, the problems of the uh, uh, ISDs. So, but as you can see now, Korea became the one of the developed countries which helps export its uh, investment across the world like this. The, uh, the, the invest, Korean investment abroad has been increased incredibly the, you know, the uh, last uh, 40, 60, uh, 60 years. The especially most uh, Korean investments were made in the developing countries, the, uh, in China or in Vietnam or something like that, other countries. So regardless of such changing circ circumstances of Korea, Korea firmly hold on the original policy to support ISA with more active uh, establishment of the BITs with other countries. As you can see, the, uh, the number of Korea's BITs uh, has been increased, uh, to especially since the uh, mid-19s. Uh, mid so first of all, uh, so I can explain the reasons of this persistence commitment to the uh, IS, uh, ISA system in the following ways. First of all, the Korea is still enormously interested in attracting the FTA like other countries. Of course, it is the uncertain whether the BITs will be beneficial uh, to attract the foreign in FTI but anyway, uh, some reports revealed that the FTI, uh, the BIT or the uh, ISA will be a kind of the critical factor in investment decision making. So, and then the second, Korea wants to secure a kind of the political stabilization. Korea is very located in the, between the two big countries, China and, you know, the, uh, America and uh, also Japan. So because of that, so uh, because of that, Korea tried to make a kind of the uh, political stabilization or something like that. And also, mm, and also another thing is that uh, 
uh, another major reasons so another major reasons is that it's a kind of the uh, I can call the this privatization of the investment protections as you know the national uh, uh, states has a kind of constitutional uh, requirements to protect their national its nationals abroad so instead uh, on the other hand also so you know um, so also uh, the Korea, uh, but its problem is that the international dispute will be quickly political burdens to the home states of the, uh, the, the investors. Traditionally, investors' home states is constitutionally required to solve this conflict with diplomatic dependencies on the behalf of its the nationals. But the problem is that Korea is economically strong but politically weak. In this context, ISA can be an attractive tool to which allow Korea to detour the political responsibilities about resolution of investment treaty, uh, investment dispute between uh, Korean and other countries. Uh, nevertheless, uh, nobody could not ignore the risk of the ISA under the, uh, the BITs anymore and civil society is the more aware of the risk of the ISA. So in this context, the new BIT was proposed, especially after Coros FTA. This the feature, one of the important features of the new BIT is a kind of a balance between the investment protection and uh, the regulatory power of the host states. So, but it's, uh, uh, so, okay. So, but it's, although it, uh, but it's problem is that, so as you can see in this uh, slide, the although it currently remains to be seen whether the ISA will be beneficial to Korea, it looks obvious that original Korea ISA policy must be seriously challenged by the public criticism. If the risks of the ISA cannot be controlled appropriately in this context, a uh, result of the current uh, investment arbitrations against the Korean government will function as a kind of a litmus test for the public to access the cost and benefits of the ISA in relation to policy discussion of the ISA. So, uh, actually, as you can see in these uh, uh, two cases, the a common feature of the two cases uh, is that is like this. Those claims are based on the clauses of clauses of old model of BITs, the, which were established the, the long time ago the, when the Korea is was a kind of developing the Korea Korea was a very poor countries. The first two case, uh, first two investment claimed against the Korean government were based on the old model that were established, as I, as I told, while Korea was still developing countries. The very, uh, of, uh, the, and then, mm. so the very recently, the Korea is involved in a third case in which uh, Iran invest filed a suit before the arbitration on the Korea-Iran BITA in the case of the third arbitration, although the relevant BIT was established in 2007, but drafting, drafting model was based on the old policies the before the Korea FTA. In this context, the Korea needs to consider the old model as a more uh, problematic issues rather than the recent concluded BITs. The Korean government's policies of ISA will be uh, seriously challenged if the government would fail in depending the legitimate government actions in the current and potential invest state arbitrations. Currently, Korean public opinion is not actively engaged in the ISA discussions after Korea-US uh, free trade agreement. The, although the progressive party of the CP, uh, progressive part of the civil society is still critical about the government, the policies, 
the many Koreans believe in government promise uh, uh, that the Korea is a safe zone from the investment claim, uh, and then uh, ISA will be a useful tool to protect Koreans from the developing countries. In this situation, if the government in those investment claims would lose, this might be seriously politicized and uh, critical opinions would gain the public support to challenge the ISDS policies. So that is the, uh, my the summary of the my presentation of something like that. So, uh, and I will uh, finish the, my presentation here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and add a bit of humor, um, if I may, and at my own expense. Um, insofar as I'm in an environment like Australia, and Australians are very sensitive about the national identity, and I make a cultural legal error, which happens fairly often, I immediately reply by apologizing and explaining that I'm a Canadian. If I make a similar mistake in Canada, where I spent most of my academic career, I basically say I'm Australian. So essentially on my head, the only uh, reality here is I'm the only Australian here, so I can really say what I like, and I might actually take advantage of that. Um, what I'm gonna do is discuss um, Australia's evolving position on investor state arbitration, as you'll see it is significantly evolving. Um, very, very politicized, um, and clearly quite significant from Canada's perspective. Uh, because of parallels, certain parallels. Then I'm going to look very briefly at the disparity between domestic protections and uh, international treaty protections um, and uh, that significance. And then I'm going to have a uh, look at the key question underlying this conference. Uh, should we be carving out a special body of law for uh, agreements between developed states that does not include investor state arbitration. And then if there's time, a brief look at the big question about model treaties, uh, Australia currently embracing creating one, but also the broader issue of multilateralism, the movement we have away from bilateralism towards broader treaties and what impact that might have on investor state arbitration among other areas. So uh, starting off with Australia's evolving position, um, we have effectively 21 bilateral treaties. Um, they were deci decided, uh, signed between 88 and 2005. Uh, they included developed countries for the most part. Um, the important ones from our, from our point of view is particularly with New Zealand. Uh, we also have one with ASEAN, New Zealand, uh, which is important, direct neighbors, major trading partners. Uh, China, we haven't yet inked it, but we have an agreement with China, Korea, very recently. Um, Chile, um, 2008, Thailand, 2004. Um, most of the treaties prior to 2002 aren't particularly germane to our discussion. Uh, no bid has been terminated, although we have consolidated the Chile uh, bit. Uh, there are 10 free trade agreements. Um, these are perhaps um, significant. Um, and in particular because they exclude um, the investor state arbitration, particularly in the United States, Australia Free Trade Agreement of 2004, the New Zealand, for historical reasons, Agreement 2011, Malaysia 2013, but not particularly relevant because uh, Malaysia, Australia, is a part of the um, uh, uh, Asian, Australia, New Zealand Free Trade Agreement, which does include investor state arbitration. Just to briefly mention that we've been involved in uh, several uh, disputes. The most significant is the case currently pending against Australia, Australia brought by Philip Morris, which is highly controversial uh, and is uh, generally perceived to be um, a case that could occur in a number of jurisdictions. It is arguably a case with significant chilling effect. 
um, and uh, definitely one which uh, Australia is taking very seriously. We have another of other, a number of other recent cases, and you can see several mentioned lighthouse case. We've also had uh, successful cases, for example, the um, a, a planet mining against Indonesia, which caused Indone Indonesia to rethink its pit policy. So there's been quite a lot of activity um, with regard to Australia, output investors perhaps more so, one case against Australia, Australia by a multinational in the form of Philip Morris. In terms of the direction of the Australian um, um, developments of investor state arbitration, um, I might add a sense of cynicism um, in that there's been a great deal of talk and a lot of it has been very poorly researched. The academics tend to be quite critical of how decisions have been made. The key player is the Productivity Commission and in 2010 they came up with a report uh, basically slamming investor state arbitration. Uh, it's a report that has been significantly maligned by academics as being economically uh, insufficient in its analysis. It doesn't really explore the economics of impact of investor state arbitration upon foreign investors, uh, both in and outbound, or the uh, countervailing issues about foreign investors being exposed to domestic courts in other jurisdictions, uh, both developed and developing countries. It's clearly a very, very strongly framed report which has been replicated in 2015 by the Productivity Commission, which is essentially a very influential body. It had enough influence in 2010 to cause the then Gillard government, the Liberal government, to adopt it, holus bolus, and the effective announcement was Australia would no longer agree to investor state arbitration in any of its future treaties. That was in 2010. And frankly, um, between, up till that time, there was very little discussion of uh, uh, investor state arbitration, other than in 2004 when Australia negotiated the free trade agreement with the United States, where there is no provision for investor state arbitration. I'll come back to that because that is important. So nothing really between 2004 and 2010. Suddenly this announcement by the Labor government that they're going to do away with investor state arbitration in treaties. Lo and behold, um, there are several treaties concluded, one with Malaysia, um, where in fact there is no uh, invest state arbitration provision. It's irrelevant, as I mentioned before, because Malaysia is a party to the Asian, Australian, uh, New Zealand free trade agreement, which includes investor state arbitration. Then we have a fall, a collapse in the, um, in the Labour government replaced by a Liberal government, um, and there's been more leaders in uh, Australia, leaders of government, uh, in the last few years than I'd like to count. And in comes um, the hero of the moment, Tony Abbott, who was just displaced two, two uh, weeks ago in an internal coup d'etat as uh, Prime Minister. And effectively, he says Australia will maintain a case-by-case -case analysis. In other words, they won't decide on principal grounds in advance whether they'll have investor state arbitration with regard to developing states. And developed states, they'll simply decide it on a case-by-case -case basis. The result is, in effect, a smorgensbord. We have an agreement with, uh, for example, um, Japan that does not include investor state arbitration. And we can debate at some length as to how that occurred, um, but we think that Japan is a bit soft on investor state arbitration, and certainly Australia has been, and on a case-by-case -case basis not included. On the other hand, South Korea insisted on investor state arbitration, so taking a case-by-case -case basis, we included it in that agreement. China similarly has insisted. There hasn't been yet promulgation, ratification, um, but in effect, that's highly likely to include investor state arbitration. The TTP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, I've been involved in that from the outset, and I always go to conferences uh, among other speakers and say, well, when the TTP comes out at the end of the year, I said that in 2013, as did many others. Uh, we said that at the end of 2014. We're saying that at the end of 2015. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, the issue is, is Australia going to seek an exemption from investor state arbitration under the TTP? And perhaps in 2019, we'll be having that discussion as well. And is Japan going to join them is going to be another question. 
for which there's no clear answers. I always talk to the negotiators, hoping somebody will give me a hint, and for the most part, I hear very little. So that's kind of where we are now in terms of uh, our position. Um, we are negotiating investor state arbitration selectively. Um, exactly why the uh, agreements are being concluded in the way they are is very, very hard to know unless you have an inside track. We think a lot of it is around political uh, issues. It's also trade-off. Investor state arbitration is a trade-off, as in anything. Your principles go so far, but economics can rule the day. And uh, of course, Australia is a middle power, and when you're negotiating with China, and China doesn't want investor state arbitration, uh, or wants investor state arbitration, Australia is probably going to say yes. Um, the um, issue with regard to general provisions for investor state arbitration, which nobody's mentioned, and I have a, a, an article co-authored with my research, research assistant, which is coming out in the Exit Review, where we try and suggest that, in fact, it's not really a question of investor state arbitration, it's how it's provided for in, in uh, treaties, and our argument is most recent treaties are drafting investor state arbitration provisions quite a lot differently, more selectively. They're actually going back a couple of generations to early variants of investor state arbitration because they're getting nervous. States are getting nervous, so they want more constraints of an investor state arbitration. And I think that's become a part of the gameplay, acknowledging that the EU, of course, has come up with something that is institutionally, structurally uh, different in the form of a court process. Um, the resistance to, um, to investor state arbitration in Australia is quite interesting in several uh, regards. One is the very strong fear, five minutes, uh, in the United States that American multinationals were going to come in and gobble up Australia. Australians are very nationalistic and very concerned about uh, their preserving their status down under. Um, and the big concern was multinationals, U.S. multinationals, drug companies, for example, um, uh, overriding the uh, pharmaceutical benefits scheme, uh, intellectual property invasions via the U.S., um, loss of national autonomy, and that was the big concern. That was in significant measure a motivation for Australia to seek to exclude investor state arbitration in the 2004 agreement with the United States, which did not include include investor state arbitration. There are other reasons given. The reasons were that Americans trust Australians and Australians trust Americans. They both have rule of law jurisdictions, so you could quite readily rely on the courts of either jurisdiction to resolve matters. Of course, Lowen, which was brewing at the time, seemed to suggest a little bit to the contrary, but that was the rhetoric. Um, we think that there was a fair amount of trading behind the lines, and we've interviewed as part of our um, Australian Research Council grant some of the negotiators, and we found that it's a lot more complicated than that simple explanation as to why there's no investor state arbitration provision in the uh, US-Australia free trade agreement. With regard to the uh, more recent concerns, um, I think perhaps similar to Australia, uh, big concerns are Australia needs autonomy over uh, public health, over the environment, over national security, and conceivably in protection of its labor forces. And these are strong motivators and very, very extensively publicized. And they are particular motivators for government. We have no government for some years that has an absolute majority. So they always put the ears close to the ground to see what the popular sentiment will be. And no government seems to want to make an outright condemnation of investor state arbitration since Gillard, nor by the same token to endorse the uh, national judicial system uh, in contrast either. Um, you can see the talk about, um, and this is um, essentially drawn from newspapers, and Luke did this. Luke and I share a, uh, an ARC grant with two other professors at um, two other universities in Australia, and you can see really nothing in the newspapers until 2004, and then from 2010 you have a little bit of an interest, and then 2012 onwards, after, uh, after Philip Morris, you have a massive increase in public awareness and governments jumping uh, to take care of it. What's the future on investor state arbitration? My view is very little consensus. 
Um, we think that if in fact there is a liberal majority that's returned, now the leader is Malcolm Turnbull, uh, the government may feel if they're in a majority that they can embrace investor state arbitration more readily. If we have another minority judge, judgment, uh, um, court, uh, uh, parliament, we might go somewhat along the lines we currently are going, case by case. If Labour wins, which is a possibility, they may revert back to a let's go to the courts, let's avoid investor state arbitration. Um, protections under domestic law, very, very briefly. Very narrow protections under investment law um, internally in Australia for domestic law. Um, again, uh, quite a great deal more under treaty law. So effectively, the old story, investors get a better deal under the treaties on grounds of expropriation uh, than they do under domestic law. And of course, they can um, challenge indirect expropriations significantly. The one important thing, the High Court of Australia has clearly endorsed the view that for domestic purposes, an expropriation is not only a taking, but it also has to be an acquisition. So it requires both elements. So again, domestic law somewhat narrower on the scope of an expropriation than international law. Therefore, pro-investor is the view um, under most, most treaties. Uh, substantively, domestic law, reluctant to extend protection for legitimate expe uh, um, expectations. As we know, one minute, significantly wider under international law. Privative clause, clauses, again, um, some degree of concern under both, but domestic law tends to be more constitutionally restrictive of privative clauses. Summary of observations, um, I think I'm gonna skip this because I think I've uh, come up with the, fa with the general conclusion that you cannot overgeneralize for Australia at this point. Um, issue is, and this is my last comment, if I can have 30 seconds, I, I won't go on to the others. Um, is there a prospect for investor state arbitration between developed states, which is the essence subtext of this conference? The argument is yes, you have arguments for and against, but there are some significant issues to consider, and I've just put them in bullets there in blocks. We're moving towards a consolidation of bilateral treaties into multilateral agreements. What does that mean for the future of investor state arbitration? I'll just ask the questions rather than pose suggestions. These treaties um, contain developed and, or these treaties are concluded between developed and developing states with various legal systems. How significant is that uh, for the abolition of investor state arbitration? It is difficult to match countries with similar legal systems, common law versus civil law, um, and with similar um, qualities of justice. Um, so even though we may be similar, um, we may also be different. Even among countries with similar legal cultures, there might be some significant concern about impartiality. The Australia, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, US free trade agreement and the Lowen case. And again, in order to move, you have to have a high degree of mutual trust among states, uh, particularly among foreign investors operating at the host stage. What does this mean for investor state arbitration? Thank you all very much. To all, all of the panelists, uh, both for their insights into the uh, state of play in their respective countries, but also to sticking to the time, which has fortunately allowed us a few minutes before lunch uh, for some questions. So I'd invite questions from the floor. And as before, if uh, people asking questions could identify themselves and, and try to keep their comments and their questions brief. Thank you very much uh, for these informative panels. Um, three quick, uh, quick points, two questions and a comment. The first question, um, going to what Leon just finished with, uh, the question of stronger national versus international protections or the other way around. Uh, this issue has come up in a number of different countries and from what you just described, it sounds like your view is that the investment treaty protections are stronger uh, protections for investors than the domestic constitutional law standards in Australia. Um, 
There's, there was argument in South Africa about it being the other way around. Uh, my colleague at the Max Planck Institute, Stefan Schill, has said actually German constitutional law is more protective of property rights than Germany's uh, bits. But I'd like to know what is the reaction in Australia to this difference in standards? Um, and why is it not, or if, is it, I guess, a concern of the government to somehow equalize the standards that they not be different under international law versus domestic law? Second, um, all of you, since you're in the, the Asia-Pacific region, one of the things that I find interesting here is that, obviously, whereas in the North American context, the US is the big kid on the block, in your area of the world, it's China that's the big kid on the block. And um, China does not have the same sorts of practices surrounding transparency, in particular, that uh, other countries do with developed uh, democracies. So is this something that is high on the agenda with the TPP negotiations to somehow get some, some concessions uh, that would then set a, a standard uh, later as well with China? Um, my Canadian colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Canadians agreed in their agreement with China that all of Canada's investor state proceedings would be transparent and open to the public, but China will decide on a case-by-case -case basis <laughs> whether that's the case. Um, and this is obviously a concern for a lot of people in developed countries. And then third and finally, I'm just going to abuse the, uh, the microphone to correct something I said in, in the last panel. Um, the enforcement of awards is not under the ICSID convention in the TTIP uh, text for the, for the um, European Commission, but you can look at it in Article 30. It's uh, supposed to be self-enforcing as under the ICSID convention. Thanks. Um, your first question is, is very pertinent. Uh, that's where the Chief Justice, Justice French, has waded in. There is very, very serious concern. Now, he's been a bit cautious. One of you mentioned that he slammed uh, investor state arbitration. He didn't. He was quite cautious in what he said. He's, ve he's very diplomatic, Justice French. But the clear worry is that international protections for foreign investors are expansive and that extend b uh, beyond domestic law. He's also very concerned about bypassing domestic courts, not unlike in uh, Canada. And he's made a number of speeches um, where he said this, and I think it is definitely a real concern to, to the judiciary. The government has tended to be less vocal because they see themselves as negotiating treaty by treaty. So you don't get position papers very clearly. And since we don't have a model treaty, it's very hard to say that we've complied with the template because we really don't have one. With regard to China in particular, I think what you're saying is, is absolutely valid. There's real concern. Um, um, Stern, you may recall, was, was arrested in China on grounds of spying for Australia. Uh, so, and we've already had the, uh, the um, Australian government um, in the uh, Wenhao case, the um, espionage case where they cancelled a contract with a large national company on the grounds that they had engaged in espionage in building, among others, the security police headquarters in Australia that's supposed to have had bug, bug devices, and the US government and the EU followed suit, and they actually also put them on a blacklist. So the, Australia, the Australians are very, very nervous of what they see as being a non-transparent Chinese legal system. By the same token, they're also very conscious of the fact that China is their largest trading partner and they have to play ball with China. Chinese foreign investment in Australia is extraordinarily large. I think, on balance, they were quite happy to have investor state arbitration in the China agreement for what you've said, but I've seen no public statement that has actually reflected what I've just said because I think it's just not something that will surface in any uh, obvious way. But I suspect what you're saying is exactly what transpired. They never had a serious disagreement on vested state arbitration, despite Australia's ambivalence, because uh, in effect, the result suited them, um, I think. Thank you. Uh, Shitaro and Yunsik, in that order, perhaps? Yes, as for China, um, yes, it's very really relevant. China, Japan concluded the first investment treaty with China in 1988, right before the Tiananmen Affair, and that was a purely a socialist style investment treaty, which allowed the investor state arbitration only with respect to the amount of compensation on, on the case of expropriation. And, uh, but Japan, Korea, and China concluded trilateral investment treaty in 2012, um, which is a 21st century style investment treaty, but unlike uh, the other treaties concluded with 
by uh, Japan or Korea, it does not provide full market access, of course. Nat natural treatment in the establishment of investment is not provided in that trilateral agreement. But we, uh, except, for, except for that, uh, that treaty is really um, an unusual uh, current uh, 21st century style uh, investment treaty. Uh, it does provide for transparency, but it's about the transparency of domestic uh, legislation. For example, you know, in the case of the domestic legislation, you have to inform and yeah, promptly the, uh, uh, the, uh, the foreign investors, etc., etc. Et the treaty was concluded in 2012, which means that before the entry into force of the ancestral transparency rules, therefore that, that ancestral transparency the rules does not apply to the, the, tra tra the trilateral agreement. So there's no transparency in the, in the investor set arbitration procedure. Thank you. I just want to add some comments about the, uh, the uh, Shataro's uh, uh, argument about that. So actually, the as you, as we mentioned, so you know, Korea and Japan and China had uh, established a, uh, investment agreement, but it's actually the Korean government promote encouraged uh, Korean investors to use uh, the ISDS uh, the tools to uh, be against the Chinese government. The, as far as I know, the second uh, claim against China. The, in the world history that was raised by the <laughs> Korean the middle sized uh, uh, companies. So at that time, so after that, so we don't know about whether this will uh, work and, uh, perfectly or not. Anyway, so this will be the, uh, this will to make a kind of the, uh, influence on the uh, next uh, the policy, the decision, policy decisions in the future. So I just add some comments to that. Thank you. I, uh, do we have time for one more question? Howard. Uh, yes, um, uh, Professor Trackman. Um, uh, I, I suppose people can, can uh, debate the specifics of what it was that Chief Justice French actually said. I note in the paper by your colleague, Professor Nottage, he tends to play it down too. But how, however strong or how, or maybe more nuanced it may be, is it not nonetheless remarkable that your chief justice, sitting chief justice, is so specific, more or less, on such a, a incredibly hot live issue. I mean, this would be unthinkable from a, a senior justice in, in England or the United States or Canada, uh, or is this par for the course in Australia? I don't think it is, but maybe you can correct me. Um, how do I say this tactfully? Um, <laughs> You, you may recall Philip Morris first went to the High Court of Australia and uh, the High Court decided against Philip Morris. Philip Morris then found a way to the uh, Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement, set up office there and proceeded under that. At the same time, um, we have a, an action, WT action, brought by a country that conveniently includes a Philip Morris factory, a large Philip Morris centre. I think um, the Chief Justice's concern was, and I think the Supreme Court of Canada would have similar concerns that a highest, the highest court effectively wasn't the highest court. Um, was he acting in any way outlandish? Lee, I don't think the general view in Australia was that he was. Um, a lot of them were public statements. He never actually, he went on and gave a detailed account of investor state arbitration. He didn't actually say, in my view, that it shouldn't occur. Um, he, he talked about it being used cautiously. Um, I wouldn't call him a judicial activist, to be frank. So this is certainly a judicial activist position outside of the courtroom. Um, did he step over the mark? I don't think so. Um, and I haven't read in any commentary, press or otherwise, that he has. And he's made three presentations um, on the topic, citing Luke's work and, and my work and others. Um, but, but maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age, but I don't see it as being that outlandish in what he said, um, although I cannot think of any Chief Justice of any other High Court that has done the same thing. So your point's well taken. Thank you. Uh, if I just, just very quick follow up, I, I mentioned it earlier this morning. As I recall, I haven't looked at the file for a long time, but 
when, I, when the Supreme Court of Canada denied leave to Eli Lilly, I believe, if I recall, it was after a very extraordinary, very lengthy oral hearing, which virtually never happens in leave to appeal applications. They're always done on paper. But this one was a long one, I believe. It's on the web. It can, uh, can be seen. It was very unusual. So uh, there's obviously some sensitivity. So I guess we'll have to see if yeah. something like this happens in Canada. So thank you very much, Tony, for chairing this excellent panel. Thank you very much. Um, Leon, Shataro, and Yunsik for your excellent presentations. And now, um, so let's give a big hand for the next. Yeah.